Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, Napod. Napod features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for Napod, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to Napod.xyz if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. Good evening, my name is Barney and I'm an alcoholic. And I want to thank Dick for uh, the introduction and um, Hal for being the voice of the convention. I had that job uh, uh, in the Southern California Convention a couple of times. And the only trouble with it is that you got to wear your suit all weekend and show up for all those meetings. Uh, but Hal told me that he's been sober for 44 years, so I guess he knows what he's doing. And I met his uh, his lovely wife, uh, Mary, today, and I I know why Hal is still around and doing well, because she is really a wonderful woman. And uh, I want to thank Joe and his wife, Ann, for waiting so late last night to pick us up at the airport. Uh, Carol and I came in from uh, California into Atlanta, and then we got delayed in Atlanta by some thunderstorms, and uh, so Joe and Ann had to wait until quite late last night and uh, pick us up over here at the airport and bring us to the hotel, and I really appreciate them doing that. And I want to thank Fred B. and uh, and all of the uh, members of the committee for inviting us to come over here. I'm always uh, a little surprised, I, you know, I really am, uh, that anybody would uh, would call me up and want me to fly 3,000 miles to to go and talk to a bunch of people I don't even know about something I don't even do anymore. <laughs> but AA is kind of a weird world, and I've been around here for just long enough to know that I'm surrounded by weirdos, so I'm in the right place, I know that, here with all the rest of the lepers, and uh, it's uh, it's 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 really nice to be here. Uh, La Jolla, California, if you don't know, is on the other coast. It sits right on the beach. And um, Carol and I actually don't live in La Jolla anymore. We still have our house there, but our children, all eight of them, have grown up and uh, and are gone now. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, and uh, they're doing uh, they're doing their thing and and uh, having children of their own and husbands and wives every now and then and uh, uh, <laughs> so we rented out the house in La Jolla and Carol moved up to uh, uh, Orange County with me, which is where I have been working and living. For the last few years, I've been working in Orange County during the week and then going home to La Jolla on the weekends. And uh, Carol really has uh, has been responsible for uh, whatever is good or bad about those kids because she's she's done all the work. And uh, but now she's up there in Orange County with me, and we're it's really weird because we're you know we she and I got married and we're both in AA. She's uh, sober longer than I am. Carol's been sober 21 years. And uh, I'm sober a little over 18 years, so she calls me the newcomer. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's it's a little strange, you know. We we had this responsibility of raising these kids over the years, uh, and and two alcoholics. You know, anytime two alcoholics are in the same house, there's a serious question on any given day as to who's in charge. You know, it's just. So we've had that struggle over the years, and, and uh, I was interested in hearing uh, uh, 
Dick and, and Peggy today talking about uh, their marriage in 25 years. They both are alcoholics, met at AA, uh, got married. Uh, I was a newcomer also. Um, uh, Dick uh, was a newcomer when, uh, when Peggy grabbed him off, and uh, <laughs> they just keep picking on us all the time. And uh, so anyway, we, uh, Carol and I have, uh, have been married down a little over 16 years, and, uh, and, but for the first time now in recent months, we have just been the two of us, you know, in the same house. And, uh, it's been, it's a little weird, you know, when you don't have kids to think about and other problems to worry about. Uh, and just, you kind of staring at one another saying, well, what do we do now? You know, I do something, so, uh. She goes off and does her AA deal, and I go off and do my AA deal, and every now and then we do it together, and, and uh, so that's kind of the way it is. But we're having an interesting time, at least, trying to adjust to this new life uh, without children. We're we're learning to to deal with grandchildren now, and they're a lot of fun, and and so we're having a good life. And I, if you're new here tonight, or relatively new, how many people have a year or less of sobriety that are in here tonight? Well, I really, I particularly want to welcome you here tonight because I always feel like a newcomer anyway. I, I, uh, I've always had a bad attitude and every now and then my attitude comes back on me and, uh, and so I identify with new people and, uh, if you're real sick, you'll identify with me. And, uh, that just means that you need to go to another meeting, that's all. But, uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of fun to, to bounce around and, and find AA in different parts of the country and different parts of, of the world. We went to a meeting in London a couple of months ago, and that was fun. And, and uh, it's it's just been a lot of fun. We've gone to meetings in Mexico City and Acapulco and Hawaii and all over the place. So AA is everywhere, and if you travel around and you move around very much, you'll discover that, and you'll find that it's, uh, it's a little different everywhere you go. I've had that experience. I'm going to tell you about that in a few minutes, because when I move from one place to another, in sobriety, I, uh, I found the AA different, and I had a very bad reaction to that, and people do. Uh, and I went from the West Coast to the East Coast uh, when I was three years sober, and I, I couldn't adjust to the AA on the East Coast. And people from New York and Philadelphia and Washington and Florida and all kinds of places come to the West Coast, and they know we're crazy. I mean, they go to those meetings out there, and they say, I don't like these meetings. They're different. And they are. They're different everywhere you go. And so I, what I've had to do is just kind of adjust to whatever's going on in the place where I am. And uh, and I've, I've kind of learned to do that, although my alcoholic mind still tells me it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about myself and uh, tell you how I got here. It wasn't for eating jelly beans, I'll tell you that. Uh, and tell you what it's been like, because I... I did not climb into a, a time capsule 18 and a half years ago, and everything's been wonderful since. I've, uh, Carol and I have had 18 and a half years of, uh, of growth. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> growth is an extraordinarily painful experience, it turns out, uh, at least for me. I don't learn anything. If things are going good, I just enjoy it. But when things are bad and I have to get through something, and i got to get through it sober, uh, I somehow come out the other end of it, and I seem to maybe learn some. And if I haven't, I'm going to have to live through it again, because I will repeat the same mistake over and over and over again uh, until finally it dawns on me that I don't want that kind of pain anymore, and then I try to change my behavior. But I continually repeat uh, the same mistakes over and over and over again, always expecting, incidentally, different results. Invariably, I think if I just keep... My behavior will repeat and repeat and repeat, and I expect different results this time. It's a little like my drinking. I expected different results sometimes when I drank. I thought, this time it'll be all right, and it hardly ever was. But I'm that kind of personality. I just, I'm a very sick man, and I have to continue to to attend these meetings because if I don't, I'll be in big trouble in, in no time flat. I was raised on the south side of Chicago, in an Irish Catholic neighborhood, and I went to Catholic schools, uh, had the Dominican nuns for, for eight years in grammar school. Any of you from Chicago was St. Lawrence, people always ask, it was St. Lawrence Grammar School. 
And then I had four years with the Carmelite priests at Mount Carmel High School in Chicago. And then I had some time with the Holy Cross Fathers at the University of Notre Dame. And uh, those people I know tried desperately to teach me some things and to and to give me some rules and some standards to live by so that I could so that I could be happy, so that I could live a comfortable life. That's all they ever wanted for me. I didn't know that at the time. I thought what they were doing was putting pressure on me. Because whenever anybody tries to whenever anybody tries to change my behavior, I I react to that as if it is pressure. Because I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And so if, if somebody comes along and says, why don't you try it this way, I perceive that as pressure, even if they mean well. And I know that those people tried very hard. I um, I was an altar boy, and I, I uh, learned my Latin, and I, I, was, I got good grades in school. I tried very hard to get good grades because somewhere along the line I got the impression that if I just did what they asked me to do, or at least appeared to be doing what they asked me to do, they would let me get promoted and they would get me good grades and I'd get along in life. And really they'd get off my back is what it really amounted to. And I was afraid of authority figures then and, and, and remained frightened of authority figures well into sobriety. And occasionally today, you know, it, it just, I'll, I'll see a, a cop car behind me on the freeway and I just, I just freeze. It's just, whoo! And, uh, and I'm not doing anything wrong, you know. I just, <laughs> just I get nervous. And, uh, or if I, you know, if I happen to be around my boss and he walks by, I just get a little edgy sometimes. I just, oh Jesus, you know. What's he thinking now? And uh, <laughs> but I had a lot of trouble, and I, I, I wanted to, uh, to do well and to look good, and I, and I, I tried. The problem was that from the time that I was seven or eight years old, it occurred to me, I suppose, that I was not a good person. I don't know when I decided that, but somewhere along the line it occurred to me that I was not a good person. There's the good people and there's the bad people, I thought, and I knew which side I was on because I'm a sinner, and I knew that I was a sinner. And, uh, and, and not only that, if the truth be known, I'm a moral leper. A moral leper is somebody who not only sins a lot, but somebody who enjoys it thoroughly. And I knew you weren't supposed to like it that much. You know, you're supposed to feel guilty once in a while if you commit sin, and I didn't... Only if I got caught, then I would feel guilty. And I would show remorse, and I would appear to be repentant. And I, you know, I repent a lot. I just always have to repent because I screw up a lot. So I have to, oh, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. And I go over and over and over. And that's true of a lot of things in my life. But um, I tried to look good. I tried not to, not to show people the, the, the dark side. I didn't want people to know what I was really like. I don't want anybody to know what's going on in here. I don't want them to really know what's going on in here. Because sometimes you just kind of think if they ever find out, they're going to put me away. <laughs> At the very least, they will shun me. They will have nothing to do with me because of this, this evil nature that I have. And so the trick is to look good. And I learned how to do that. I learned how to look like I was getting it. I know how to look like I'm getting it. I did that in AA for a long time. I did. Because I didn't get it. But I know how to go, ooh, you know. Yeah. And I'd sit there and I'd, what are they talking about? I don't understand. But I don't want anybody to know that. 
I don't want people to know how dumb I feel sometimes and how inadequate I feel sometimes and how frightened I am sometimes just to being among people, just being in a crowd of people, especially like people I don't know. I walked through the hotel lobby today, and again, there was that strange sense that I have. They all know one another, and they don't like me. <laughs> you know. I get weird thoughts like that. I just, oh, Jesus. And I went out to get on the bus tonight. You know, I was going to get on the bus and ride over here. And I was standing out there and I thought, why don't you just say hello to somebody? They're all alcoholics. <laughs> it's okay, you know. And I just, I couldn't have stood there for a while like a dummy. And, and, uh, and finally, some people in a car came by and opened the door and said, is there anybody alone who would like a ride? You know, I said, great. So I got in the car, and we're halfway over here, and the lady said, Boy, I'm really looking forward to hearing Sandy B. I said, Sandy's talking tomorrow night. Eight o'clock, if you're wondering. And she said, oh, God, who's talking tonight? The other lady said, oh, I don't know. And she looked at the program. Oh, some Barney from California. <laughs> and the lady said, well, I don't know him. Anyway. <laughs> But it was nice, you know, it was, it was fun to just laugh about that because I finally did tell them I was the speaker and we, and we were laughing and kidding around about it. And then they all left to have ice cream and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> why do I digress? Anyway. Here I was, you know, trying to get along in the, in the world and trying to be a good guy and trying to look good and trying to shape up and trying to do all the right things. And I can't do the right thing because I'm a screw up and because I'm a sinner and because I, I just know there's something wrong and I don't know what the hell's the matter. I'm wired wrong. And, and now I want to be successful. I want to make it. I grew up in a, in a neighborhood where nobody really had anything. None of us knew that we were relatively poor because everybody was in the same boat. But when I hit my teens, and especially when I got to the University of Notre Dame, I discovered there were people that actually have dough. I mean, there's people rolling in this stuff, you know. Got money, they got houses, they got cars. And, uh, boy, I like that. And I decided that I, I guess, without even really thinking about it, I began to kind of have this image in my mind, I need to be successful. I must be successful. Now, my measurement of success, and again, I never wrote this down anywhere. It was just, I guess, somewhere in my head. My measurement of success was the very thing that Dick and Peggy were talking about today, was stuff. The accumulation of stuff. That's how I measure success. If you got a lot of stuff, you know you're okay. <laughs> and if you don't have any stuff, you're screwed. It's just the way it is. And I, and I set about this business of trying to get a lot of stuff because I knew I'd feel okay about me and about the world and about life if I could just get some stuff. Oh, by the way, I, in case I forget to tell you, I made a magic discovery in AA after several years of sobriety. I just need you to know this in case you're thinking the way I was thinking. There isn't enough. <laughs> I just thought I'd let you know that. Because <clears throat> I almost went crazy finding that out. Uh, but I got into a business very early on out of college that allowed me to have some success and to make some money and to get some stuff. Uh, I got into the radio broadcasting business. In, uh, in, Monroe, in Monroe, Michigan, and in Toledo, Ohio, and then in Detroit. And then I and went in, on into television, and I was doing television news. And I, and by the time I was 26 years old, I was the anchor man for a television station owned by ABC in Detroit. And uh, I had married a woman 
And uh, we had six kids, and we had we had a house, and we had cars, a lot of stuff, <laughs> TV sets and stuff. It was just wonderful. And uh, and I still had this terrible anxiety, this terrible frustration, this terrible fear that I was never going to get enough, or that it was they were going to find out. That's one of the great fears. I don't know what the hell it is I don't want them to find out, but I don't want them to know. <laughs> and so I was working and I was plotting and I was trying to be a success and I'm trying to make it and I'm just crazy, just crazy all the time. I don't know what the hell's the matter. I figure it's her. Or it's those kids. It's the responsibility. I, I can't take that pressure. It's the bills. It's the, I can't pay the bills. It's just too much. It's, I'm making a lot of money and I just, we're spending too much and I'm just crazy. And I go to work and I'm trying to look okay. And I just wake up in the morning and I'm just full of tension and anxiety and frustration because I gotta be successful. I gotta make it. I gotta be something in this world and I know I'm nothing. That's the problem. I know I'm nothing. And I and I, I get dressed and I go to work and I walk in and the boss walks by and here I am the the anchor man and the boss walks by and he says hey how you doing Barney what am I supposed to do tell him the truth <laughs> look him right straight in the eye and say well I'm I'm afraid. Oh, really? What are you afraid of? I don't know. Piece of shit out of me. I just... <laughs> been this way all my life. I'm just... Crazy and scared all the time. <clears throat> or you walk into a newsroom full of bright people, well-educated people, and, and you sit there and, and you're the anchorman, and the producers and the writers are all sitting there, and they look at you and they say, Hey, how's it going, Barney? You say, Well, I... I have a deep-seated sense of... anxiety and... I feel terribly inadequate here. I'm scared to death I'm going to lose this job because they're going to find out and I'm... No. The correct answer is, I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I've walked around most of my life knowing, for example, that I am far more sensitive than you are. Now, you don't always know that, and so you hurt me. But it's important for you to know that you have to treat me special for me to feel equal. <laughs> because if you don't know that, you're going to hurt my feelings. Because if you treat me equal, I'll feel like you're just screwing me again. <laughs> I walk around with this fear and this sensitivity and this feeling of anxiety and frustration and a sense of not belonging and not fitting in exactly and I don't know what the hell's the matter. There, there was a friend of mine in AA that used to describe it perfectly, and the first time I heard him say it, I knew what he was talking about. He said... I used to think there was going to be this spaceship that was going to land one day. It was going to come right down here in Daytona Beach, and three guys are going to get out that look just like me and say, come on, Barney, we're going home now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just... Whoa! Now... Somewhere in my middle 20s, and I don't know when it was, I, nobody put a plaque on the wall or anything, but somewhere in my middle 20s, I made a magic discovery. I made the magic discovery, I think, that every alcoholic sooner or later has to make. And it's so simple. The discovery was, when I drink, I feel better. Alcohol makes me feel better. That's why I drink it. If spinach made me feel like that, 
I would buy a spirits farm and I I would lay in the field and just stuff it in my mouth. And well-meaning people probably would come along and say, Barney, you're eating too much spinach. And I'd say, oh, no, just a little more. I said, well, don't you understand what it's doing to your liver? Oh, yeah, I, uh, pretty soon I'll quit. Uh. Because what they don't know and what I can't explain to them is spinach makes me feel really good. I have a granddaughter, a little baby granddaughter. And she said to my wife one day, this, I don't know, they were talking about going somewhere, and Carol said somehow, would you like to get some ice cream? And my granddaughter said, oh, yes, grandmother. Chocolate ice cream makes me feel very, very good. <laughs> and Carol said to me that night, what have we got here? We got, oh. <laughs> Save a chair for her. Oh. But I drank a lot because alcohol made me feel better. And, and, and anything that's that good, I'm going to use a lot of it, and I did. And, uh, and the, only, the only problem with that is that there is this sad side of it. Alcohol makes me feel better. I drink a lot of it, but I tend to overshoot the mark. I tend to get in a lot of trouble. I tend to do bizarre things. Bizarre. I tend to disappear and forget where I am and lose my car and travel around and I don't remember traveling. I tend to forget where I've been, forget who I talked to, forget who I angered that night, forget who I have to apologize to the next day. I tend to forget and I tend to move. And at one time, uh, somebody asked me today if I'd ever been to Florida before. Well, I used to come to Florida on my way to Jamaica. I used to stop at Miami and change planes. And I had friends that lived in Jamaica. And I used to go down there frequently, about a, just about every winter, because we were living in Detroit. And so we would go to Jamaica in the wintertime. Well, one time I woke up in the Miami airport, and I was, I, I was uh, not sure what airport I was in, because the last thing I could remember was having a couple of drinks in a bar in Detroit on Friday night. And, and now it was Saturday afternoon, as it turns out. And I, and I don't know why I went to Miami. I guess I was probably on my way to Jamaica. I don't know what the hell I was thinking about. <clears throat> but I just, I don't know. It was just, and it's embarrassing to try to explain to people when you get home, you know, because inevitably the question is, where have you been? <laughs> and the answer is, you don't want to know. <laughs> and my behavior was strange and crazy and weird and bizarre when I drank. And so from time to time, in order to get her off my back, in order to get my bosses off my back, because my reputation was starting to get around a little bit at ABC, and in order to get people to leave me alone, I would go on the wagon. I would quit drinking for a while. Okay, I'll quit drinking for a while. And I would make two, three, four days and just get crazy. Because if I don't drink... What I'm left with is stark reality. And I don't deal with stark reality very well. I don't like it. Stark reality for me is small screen, black and white. Boring! Go to work every day. Show up on time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go home at night. Take out the garbage. Cut the grass. Shape up! Take the kids to Y Indian guides and make totem poles. <laughs> Take them to Little League. And it's, uh, it's boring and it's frustrating and it's no fun. 
And after about five days of that, I began to feel great tension. Great anxiety. Because I have this terrible sensitivity and I have this, this fear begins to wash over me. My feeling that I'm getting screwed all the time starts to come back on me. And people are not nice to me and I'm just, I don't know what the hell's the matter and I feel so bad and I, I'm just getting crazy. And, uh, it's awful. And, and, and after about a week of no drinking, people tend to walk up to me and say, Oh, it's so wonderful. You look so good. The puffiness has gone out of your face and your eyes are not all red like they were. And my response to that, if I was being honest, would be, how would you like it if I ripped out your jugular vein? <laughs> and I, I don't know how to explain to them because most of the people around me, these do-gooders, these nice people, are social drinkers, and I don't understand them, and they don't understand me. Social drinkers are just weird people. Just weird. You give a social drinker a drink and then you go around and pour everybody else a drink and have a couple for yourself on the way. And you come back to the social drinker and you're getting ready to pour him another drink. And he says, oh no, thank you. I'm beginning to feel it. And you want to say, yeah, that's when it gets good. Now it's good. <laughs> or they say, no, I, I have to work tomorrow. Who cares? <laughs> or they give you that other shot. Oh, I'm driving. Oh, really? Oh, jeez. <laughs> so am I, baby. I'm getting there. Don't worry about it. Want to race home on the freeway? <laughs> so I don't hang out with people like that. They make me nervous and uncomfortable. I hang out with people like me. And then after a while, you run out of people like me because I become more bizarre than anybody. And I'm just, even the heavy drinkers are looking at me funny. I ran out of friends and I ran out of people and I ran out of everything. Nobody wanted to be around me anymore because I'm so goddamn crazy. But the problem is if I stay sober, I get crazy. I can't stand it. And so what happens five, six days a week, two weeks maybe? Oh, hardly ever two weeks. <laughs> a week. And I go out and have a couple of drinks because I need to have some relaxation. I need to... Take the sharp edges off. I've got to relax. Don't you understand? I'm under this tremendous pressure of my job and these kids and that wife of mine. And I have a couple of lousy drinks. Big deal. A couple of drinks. Everybody else does it. And uh, and I feel better. And I wonder why I waited so long. <laughs> hey. Let's have some drinks for everybody here. <laughs> Linguini for the house. Barney's here again, and we're going to do some drinking now, baby. Have some fun. And then I overshoot the mark, and I and I tend to get very drunk, and I tend to forget, and I tend to travel, and I tend to lose my car, and it all happens again, over and over and over and over again. The same repetitive, exhausting behavior. Always kind of expecting a little different result. 
But it's never different. It's always sickening, bizarre, and crazy. And yet, well-meaning people will say to me, well, it looks like you have a drinking problem. And I know that's not true because I feel better when I drink. No, 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 no. No, no, I feel bad when I'm sober too long. I have a severe sobriety problem. Well, I don't know where you go when you're weird like me, when the problem looks like it's drinking. Because, hey, when I drink, I look very alcoholic. And a lot of people made that mistake. But I know that's not true. Because I know that I'm successful, and I know that I'm making it in the world, and I know that I'm trying to get my career moving, and I know that I just, I'm, I'm not understood by a lot of people. Okay, I'm different. I understand that. But God damn it, it's just, it's the way I am. It's the way I was born. I'm just a little crazy. Give me a break. Well, my wife gave me all the breaks she wanted to, and when I was 35, she divorced me. I looked at her and I said, oh, really? What are you going to do without me? I said, I'll tell you what's going to happen here. You're going to walk out the door and I'm going to demand custody of the six children. She said, oh, you can have them. And she left. <laughs> oh, it's funny now! God, and, the, and, the, and the, the court, the judge ordered my house sold, and, and the two lawyers split what was left. And I had a resentment against lawyers for a long time. Now I sponsor a couple of them. I get my revenge. <laughs> Work your steps, you son of a bitch! <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> but I ended up in Santa Monica in this apartment with my six children. And the oldest one was 12, and the youngest one was a year. And I found myself sitting down and talking to my oldest, my 12-year-old daughter, saying to her, Well, honey, now you have to be the lady of the house. And then I went on and got drunk. And I... Uh, because I don't know what else to do. Because I have no other solution. I have no other answer to how I feel. I don't know how else to feel better. I don't know. I, I when I got drunk and in the middle of the night I came to and I realized what the hell was going on. I just realized, Jesus, I'm sitting here drunk and those kids are home alone. What am I going to do? And I'm broke. Jesus, my stuff was gone. It was gone. I owed thousands of dollars. I didn't know how to pay. I was just, I just felt life was just so, just pressing me down into the ground. And it wasn't my fault. Just, I, I, I really felt that I'd been the victim of a lot of bad breaks and misunderstandings. I really did. And I didn't know what to do. And I thought, well, what I gotta do if I get some stuff again? Then I'll be okay. That's the problem. She was disloyal, but who cares? I'll, I'll get my stuff back. But I gotta stay sober here. I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't behave this way right now. Because I'm not alcoholic, not really. 
But I get drunk a lot, and i got to stop this. And so what I'll do, and here's my wonderful alcoholic mind, figure this one out. I will just quit drinking for a couple of months, and I'll get organized. I'll get my head clear, and I'll start thinking better again. And I'll be all right. But my problem, remember, is that I can't stand sobriety. And so what am I going to do? Well, there's those A and A's. They don't drink. And I met this guy who told me, get this, told me he hadn't had a drink <laughs> in four and a half years. <laughs> Can you imagine? And I, I had this guy's card and I called him up and I said, I said, I, I need to stop drinking for a little while. <laughs> and I said, I know you haven't had a drink in four and a half years, but my problem's not that severe. I just need... <laughs> a couple, three months, I'll be fine. Just, But I can't seem to quit for more than about a week on my own. And I'm not really alcoholic, not in the way that you people are alcoholic. It's not that I wake up with a terrible craving every day and uh, can't stop drinking. Sometimes I stop for long periods of time. <laughs> Days. <laughs> he said, well, we've got to go to these meetings. And I said, well, I can't go to these meetings. No. Well, why not? Well, because do you know who I am? Do you understand what I do for a living? I'm a television anchor man. Do you understand that? I cannot appear in public with them. Somebody might get the wrong idea. I said, it could really destroy my career. He said, well, how much good do you think it's doing your career dancing on them tables at 3 o'clock in the morning? I said, well, if we go to the meeting, then what's, what's going to happen there? He said, just come to the meeting. So we went to the Beverly Hills Men's Stag. I was living in L.A. We went to the Beverly Hills Men's Stag. And there was about 60 guys there, and they're all standing around, and, and uh, they handed me this book. And it, and it just it said, Alcoholics Anonymous, all over the front of it. And it was just... <laughs> and then you sit down, and they all tell these war stories, you know, about how terrible it was. And, and then they all stand around and hold hands and say the Lord's Prayer, which was a little spooky because I don't believe in God. And uh, that's a little strange. And I hadn't held hands with a man in a long time anyway. <laughs> and there was a certain amount of hugging going on there. <laughs> Grown men hugging one another. And this big guy who'd taken me to the meeting is a former San Francisco 49er football player. And he comes up to me, puts his arms around me, says, I love you. <laughs> oh. I don't think so. <laughs> no. No. Not even if you shave, son of a bitch. No, no, no. No, no. Ha! Oh, it's weird. And I, uh, and, and they seemed to think it was important to do this every night. And I couldn't, for the life of me, understand that, because I didn't drink every day all the time. And I explained that to this guy. I said, I don't drink every day. He says, it doesn't make any difference. We go to the meeting every night. I said, oh. So I thought, what the hell, for a couple of months, can't hurt, right? So I went to the meetings, and I sat there, and I listened to this dribble, this absolute crap. Just night after night after night of crap. Just people telling me these horrible stories about themselves, jails and hospitals and institutions. I mean, some sick people in these places. And you sit and listen to this stuff, and you say, holy Christ, this is terrible. And invari you know, invariably you get the guy who says, well, I, I finally ended up on Skid Row, 
And I, and I couldn't sell my blood anymore. It was no longer up to their standards. And I had no teeth left, and I just was laying in the gutter ready to die. And, and then two men brought me here. We walked through that door, and I put the plug in the jug. And I've walked these 12 golden steps. And I have found God here. And any number of families have returned. And, and this wonderful program is just... Now I'm sober for 37 years. And I've become a multimillionaire. And Come and see me in my home sometime. Tell me how you feel. <laughs> and I said to this man one night in one of those interminable coffee shops, they always go to coffee shops and sit and talk and talk and talk. I said to this guy one night, I said, you know, I know why I'm not like them. He said, why? I said, because when they stop drinking, they feel better. I heard him say it. I've tried that hundreds of times. I never feel better. I don't feel better now. I'm getting crazier by the day. Tonight on the way to the meeting, I was thinking of driving my car into a concrete abutment just so I didn't have to come and listen to one more speaker and hear one more moron walk up to me and say, have you found God yet? And he'd say, I know what's wrong with you. You need to be a floor mopper. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, you, you get to be a floor mopper on Tuesday night. <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, when you're mopping the floor, it's a period of attitude adjustment. <laughs> I said, that doesn't make sense. He said, of course. So I became a floor mopper on Tuesday night. And then I complained some more and I became a coffee maker on Saturday night. When I told him one night that I hated people, hated people, he said, oh good, you're the new greeter on Thursday night. Oh, the man is crazy. <laughs> so I'm making coffee and I'm mopping floors and I'm greeting people. And he says, one night he hands me a list of three guys' names and he sends me down to these hotels near Skid Row to pick them up and take them to the meeting. And I said, that's out of my way. <laughs> and I don't like those neighborhoods. He said, well, you got the car. They don't have a car, and you got one. I said, oh, okay. So I pick him up and took him to the meeting, you know. I'd get real nervous because they start asking me questions. Because <laughs> I've been sober 20, 25 days already. And to them, who they got two, three days, you know, I'm sober forever. Oh, man, 25 days, holy Christ. I never made 25 days, Jesus. I'd say, well, it's just a day at a time, you know, just. <laughs> it helps if you're a floor mopper, but, uh. I have that job now, and you'll have to wait. And I don't 
don't have any idea what's going on. I don't understand. I don't understand. They're reading the same crap out of the book every night like they can't remember it. <laughs> you know, chapter 5 and how it works. And now here are the traditions. I never understood that. I thought it's to quiet the crowd down after the coffee break. I don't know what that little <laughs> Traditions, what is that? I, mean, I, I, just, I just went to meetings and went to meetings and went to meetings, and it was just crazy. And one day I turned around and I made a discovery, just out of the blue. I just made a silly discovery. I sat in a meeting one night thinking nothing, as usual, <laughs> hating it, wanting to get the hell out of there. And, uh, and I heard a speaker talk, and he said, and then I made this discovery. I discovered after six months, and, and I hadn't had a drink, and I was six months sober. And that struck me as a little weird, and I, I went, ran that through my brain again. I discovered I hadn't had a drink in six months, and I was six months sober. And interestingly enough, right at that time, I started counting. I was six months sober. I said, ooh, I'm six months sober. I haven't had a drink in six months. I'm six months sober. I wonder how I did that. And in California, I don't know how you do in Florida, but in California, at the end of a year, we give a birthday cake with a candle for each year of sobriety, and everybody sings happy birthday. And I used to think that was really stupid and sophomoric and childish, like a lot of things at AA. And But when I figured out I had six months, I got sitting there thinking about that. And I thought, Jesus, I wonder if I'd get one of them cakes. <laughs> and I could make a speech. <laughs> and tell them all it doesn't work. Because they don't like their book, and I don't believe in God. <laughs> and then the redhead back here walked through a meeting one night, and I had a spiritual experience. <laughs> I was into deep breathing exercises, chasing her around the meetings. And I said, come on, I'll you know, have some coffee or something after the meeting. And she said... I don't date newcomers. I said, well, I'm new now. I'll be old later. What the hell's the difference? Just a cup of coffee. One day she looked at me and she said, how many children do you have? I said, well, I have six, but they're very small. They're just a little... You can hardly notice them. And when I was seven months sober, I heard a man speak one night. He wasn't even a guy I liked. You can learn a lot from people you don't like in AA. You learn more from people you don't like than the people you do. I think. I have. And I didn't like this guy, and I heard him speak, and I identified with him. I didn't mean to. It just happened. I, I, by accident, I was listening. I just... And I didn't identify with this guy's drinking story. He was a skid row guy. What I identified with was how he felt about himself and about other people and about life and about the world. And he described fear in a way that I had never heard it talked about before. And he described the sense of anxiety and this belief that he didn't really fit in very well most places. And this, this feeling that he was just somehow inadequate. And it just made him feel grungy and crummy most of the time. And he said, if you're walking around with a set of emotions, anything like what I'm describing, and you seem somehow unable to control and enjoy your drinking, there's a name for that. Turns out it's a disease. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it's called alcoholism. Well, I'll be damned. <laughs> well... Carol and I got married when I was a year and a half sober. She had two kids. I had six kids. We raised the eight kids. When I was two years sober, I got a big job back east. <clears throat> and this is the point I was telling you about when I went back east, and I, and I didn't like the AA particularly, and I wasn't comfortable there. 
The meetings were different. They didn't do it the same. They didn't have birthday cakes. They didn't read chapter 5. They didn't read the traditions. I was very offended by that. <laughs> and, uh, and so I did the only thing that any right-thinking egomaniac can do. I uh, denied them my presence. I didn't go to their meetings much. I just, uh, I'd drip in, drop in once in a while just to see if they were coming around at all, you know. <laughs> and I started a meeting. I said, I'm going to start a California style meeting. And I did. This was in Philadelphia in the main line. The meeting's still going. And, uh, we started this meeting and we read chapter five and we read the traditions and we had speakers and we had birthday cakes and we said hi to the speaker. And, uh, boy, it was different. And I thought, well, I'll get along on that. And uh, my wife and I, unfortunately, began to fight and argue and not get along very well. My kids began to use drugs and drink. They hit their teens and grew fangs. <laughs> the ratings were not going up at this station where I was working. My success was going out the window, and I... I just, I didn't know what the hell was the matter. Hell, I was three years sober. Something's wrong here. What's, what's wrong? What's going on? And a man with 18 years of sobriety sat down with me one night and he said, how you doing, Barney? And I said, I'm really in bad shape, Phil. He said, what's the matter? And I told him this bitch I'd married and I told him the problems I had with these kids, they don't straighten out. This job, the ratings are not going up and I'm not getting stuff like I should. I can't stand the goddamn AA meetings. I think it's terrible. I, I don't, I'm not drinking. I haven't had a drink in three years, Phil. Life is just not good for me. He said, how many meetings do you go to? I said, well, not, not a lot. I'm busy. You know, I, I got a job here. I'm trying to get my career moving. He said, how many newcomers do you work with? I said, well, I don't do that. He said, why not? I said, I don't, I don't like them. <laughs> I said, I used to try to work with newcomers, but they all got drunk, and I, uh, I really haven't met any newcomers here on the East Coast. He said, yes, I know. They go to those meetings you don't attend. He said, what are you doing about the third step? And I said, I don't believe in God, Phil, okay? My third step, just so that I could get to a fourth and a fifth step, I, I took a third step, and I decided my higher power was, first of all, was my sponsor. And then I thought, well, he could, he could get drunk. So then I made it my group. And then I thought, nah, not big enough for me. So I decided my higher power would be all of the alcoholics around the world, sober, linked together in spirituality. He said, how's that working for you today? I said, well, it doesn't work at all. It's just what I did. He said, well, I think you've got to go to those meetings whether you think they're properly run or not. And he said, I think you must begin to work with newcomers because they may save your life. And he said, I think you have to begin to pray, Barney. And I said, I can't pray because it makes me feel like a phony. He said, well, that's okay. You are a phony. <laughs> I said, what do you want me to do? Say a phony prayer? He said, sure. <laughs> to a phony God? Sure. Why not? Okay. I can do that. So I start going to the meetings and sitting there and hating them, hating all the people. And he told me, he said, keep your mouth shut. Just put your ass in the chair and leave your head outside and shut up. <laughs> and so I did. I sat there and I listened to these people, knowing they had it wrong. Their interpretation of the book was incorrect. But I didn't say anything. Let them all die in their ignorance. 
I started grabbing newcomers by the throat <laughs> and threatening them. So you call me at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Do you understand that? And some of them did. I don't know why. And some of them stayed sober. And I don't know what to do with them when they're sober. I have no idea. But they won't leave you alone. They're on the phone. They're in your living room. They're in the kitchen. They're just on your ass. What meeting are we going to tonight? So what do you mean, we? You're the newcomer. God damn it. I used to sit with these guys, and I, I didn't know what else to do with them, so I finally started telling them the truth. Just anything to get rid of them. Jesus, I finally opened the zipper, let them see what was inside. I finally learned how to do that. Just open it up, let them see. They'll go away. I'd say, I'm a sick cookie, don't you understand that? You are talking one of the sickest men you ever met in your life. I hate Alcoholics Anonymous. I especially hate spiritual people. I think the book is badly written. And I don't like you. The only reason I talk to you is to save my own ass. You understand that? And the ones I get are so sick, they look at me and say, Oh, I identify with you. <laughs> I say, Oh, shut up. Let's go to a meeting. Come on. Uh, get out of here. I find it, you know, I used to worry about being a bad sponsor. I used to worry so much. I don't know what to tell people. I'm not spiritual. I'm not wonderful. I don't know what to tell. I can't. I don't know how to steer people's lives. I can't. I don't know what to do. Finally, one of my favorite people of all time, Clancy, who was my AA grandfather, he, he sponsors a lot of people, and I figure he knows something, you know. He's working with people all the time, and they seem to do what he tells them to do, and it's just great, and I don't know what to do. And I heard him say once, and it just, Jesus, it was a relief. He said, the real job of the sponsor is to keep the baby amused until AA works. <laughs> what a relief. I know how to keep amused. Go make the coffee, you dummy. Become a floor mopper. <laughs> Carol and I, I got fired from that job back east, and I came back to San Diego, and I ran out of money again. I went broke when I was six years sober, and I, for five months I couldn't work, and I couldn't think, and I couldn't function. And I, I knew that I, I just, I, life was over. And my wife said to me one day, she said, what the hell's the matter with you? I don't understand. You're just crazy. I said, I know. <laughs> and she said, are you going to get a job or what? We can't live this way. We're going to lose the house. Don't you understand? They're going to take it away. The bank is writing us letters here. I said, I don't know what to do. She said, well, are you going to get a job? I said, I don't know. I'm on, I'm on the prayer and meditation step right now. <laughs> what do you think, Barney? I don't know. What do you think? They're all screwing you again. You know that, don't you? And she told me she was going to divorce me. I knew we were going to lose the house, and I was broke again, and I just felt like such an utter and complete and total failure. I didn't know what to do. And I was six years sober. I had guys that I was sponsoring that were driving up to my house in Mercedes-Benz. Better shape than I was. And I just felt so sick and so crazy and so lonely and so tired, and I just didn't know what to do. And I knew that when you're six years sober, you're supposed to feel better than that, and I didn't. 
And I went down and sat in front of a bar in La Jolla one night for two hours, and I sat there and I thought about drinking, and I thought about drinking, because it's the only solution I have. It's the only solution I ever had. And I sat there, and I guess I'd just been to too many AA meetings. I don't know. Because <laughs> I didn't go in and drink. I just thought, God, that's not going to work either. You're really screwed now. And I went down and I sat on the beach in La Jolla and I cried and I cried and I cried and it was midnight and it was March. It was cold out there. I know damn well I was alone. I cried and I cried for me and I cried for my children and I cried for my life and I cried because it was I was so desperate and so lonely and so just out of sorts with the world and I didn't know what the hell was the matter. And finally I knew what I had really secretly known all my life. I, I really am nothing. I really am appealed zero. I really am a loser. Jesus, what a loser. And what a terrible feeling to have about yourself. And I just couldn't stand it, but I knew it was true. And I knew that my wife was going to leave me because I was a loser. She told me that. And I knew she was right. And I knew I was such a phony, such a phony, such a goof. And I was sitting there, and I was saying this prayer because this guy taught me this phony prayer, and I was saying this phony prayer. And I stopped, and I thought, what do you do that for? You don't even believe in God. Why do you do that? And I finally looked up because that's where he's supposed to be. And I said, you son of a bitch! I give up! you got to be careful what you say. Because what I meant that night was, I can't make it. I can't su succeed. I'm never going to be the richest man in the cemetery. I'm just never going to make it. I'm just, I'm never going to have any stuff. I'm just nothing. I just give up. I can't stand it anymore. I can't stand the pressure trying to be somebody because I'm nothing. And that's how I felt. But what I did not know that night, and for a long period of time after that, was that I was beginning the awful, agonizing, painful process called surrender! <laughs> I believe tonight as I stand here that my principal problem in sobriety is ego! And my principal solution is surrender. And I gotta remember that. And Chuck C said to my sponsor Johnny once, Johnny, Johnny was talking to Chuck, and Chuck used to talk about, he came to the program surrendered. And Johnny was talking to him and he says, Chuck, when I was laying in the, in the LA County jail dying, and I screamed out for help, don't you think I surrendered? And Chuck said, yeah, Johnny, I think you probably did. He said, well, how come I drank again? He said, oh, cause you gotta do it every day. Oh, Clancy used to say, we, we come to AA and we throw in the towel. And after we start feeling a little bit better, we look at it and we decide, that's my towel, you son of a bitch. <laughs> and then we begin to tear off little pieces and throw them in. See if this will satisfy the bastards today. <laughs> I had never... See, the problem is, I had never really looked at the third step. I'd heard it read a thousand times in meetings. I just never looked at it. You know what it says? The third step, it's amazing. I know, I know you know, but I didn't know. It says, made a decision to turn my life and my will over. Huh? See, what I never noticed is, that's everything! There ain't nothing else! It's all I got! My life, my will's everything. My kids, my wife, my job, my money, my car, my stuff. It's none of my business. It is none of my business whether she loves me or not. It is none of my business whether she's happy. That's her problem. It is none of my business how much money I make. They're going to decide that. I'm not. You think bosses listen to me? It's none of my business 
how my children behave in the long run because, you see, the thing I found out about people is they pretty much do what they want to do. Did you ever notice that? <laughs> and children, it turns out, much to my surprise, are people. Our oldest boy is sober almost 10 years in AA. I had nothing to do with that. I tried to get him to AA. I tried to take him to AA. I sponsored him. He kept getting drunk and loaded. He went to AA because he didn't want to die anymore. He got a sponsor that I knew was doing it all wrong. And he's sober almost 10 years. <laughs> they, they're getting divorced now, he and his wife. And that's another painful process that we're going through. This, this agonizing thing of watching the two of them. And, and hearing from her and hearing from him and getting both sides and, and, and having to say to them, and it hurts, God damn it, it hurts, to say, I am sorry, I'm not in the people-fixing business today. Thank you very much. I can share with you what I have, but I, I cannot fix you. And I can't fix him. And I can't fix her. And it hurts. I'd like to play God. I can't. I just have to try to protect those little kids as best I can, the little grandchildren, take care of them when we're doing that. And we'll watch the process. But I have children who are doing very well. We just visited my son in Italy who was playing baseball in the Italian League. He was the most valuable player in the Italian League last year. I visited my daughter in England who's now, oh, Jesus, dating an Englishman. Oh, God. <laughs> my mother would die. And... My poor Irish mother, you know. And we have a side of a son who's a doctor. This is a kid who used to walk in the walls. <laughs> Last year, he was, believe it or not, he was surgeon of the year, uh, intern surgeon of the year at UCLA. And he, uh, here's a kid who can't cut with scissors. I have daughters who are working in television production in Hollywood and doing extremely well. And uh, I have a son who's selling, travels all over the West Coast and, 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 and sells for Turner Broadcasting. Hmm, nobody's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but he's doing, he really is doing extremely well. I'm so proud of him. And he's married and they have this little red-headed girl and she's so cute. And it's just great. You know, life is good. Carol and I now, we're married 16 years. And... Uh, uh, you know, I, there's people in here, he's been married 49 years, and there's people in here been married a long time. So 16 doesn't sound like much, but in my group it's the record so far. <laughs> a lot of funny stuff going on there all the time, but I... <laughs> I have finally, I've learned an awful lot about love from this woman. I love Carol. Somebody called me on the phone, one of the, Fred called me on the phone, God love him. And he said something about, Barney, I want you to come over. You're going to be the VIP. Uh, and, and, and it's really one. And I heard that, and I thought, well, you know, that's not true. My wife is over 21 years. She wouldn't get behind one of these podiums to save her life. She's the VIP in my life. She is the VIP in my life. Because without her, I wouldn't know anything about love. Without her, I wouldn't know anything about sharing. Without her, I wouldn't really know much about AA because I watch her work with her babies. She works with a lot of women. And you know what? She really cares about them. It's amazing. I don't understand that. <laughs> but she teaches me a lot about AA and she teaches me a lot about just life and people and loving and caring and all that stuff that I never learned much about. I have a comfortable job today. I, went, I finally went back to work, and I decided that I would just show up and look alert because I don't know what else to do. <laughs> I've been doing that back there now for for about 11 years, and and uh, and it's fine. I show up every day. I look alert, and uh, and they pay me. It's a great relationship. <laughs> uh, they keep giving me raises. I haven't asked them for a dime. 
they give me raises all the time. And uh, they ask me to negotiate contracts, and I say I, I, I don't negotiate anymore. And uh, they say, well, what do you want us to do? And I say, well, just write a number on a piece of paper, and I'll sign it. How would that be? And they always make the number bigger than I would ask them for. <laughs> and I laugh, and I sign it. But see how much money I make is none of my business. The kind of car I drive is none of my business. I have to do my business. My business is to show up and look alert in AA, at my job, wherever I'm asked to be. Yeah, that's why I go to Daytona Beach, you know. <laughs> talk to a bunch of people about something I don't even do anymore. Because, because I believe that it is my responsibility to just show up and try to look reasonably alert and, and, um, and, and I know, see, I'm surrounded by so many people uh, at a conference like this one. I mean, the speakers you have here are phenomenal. Phenomenal. <laughs> and so I don't have to worry about it, see. I can just come and sandwich in between people like that, and I don't, it's no big deal. Uh, and, and uh, you know, you are going to hear a great speaker tomorrow night, and Sandy and, and Pat's going to talk tomorrow morning, give you some really good Al Anon stuff. And uh, lots of good speakers here, Dick and Peggy, and so many people. And, uh, you know, but I, I'll tell you, the, the key to it all, I think, is going what's going on in the lobby and on the bus and in the hotel. And it's just one drunk talking to another drunk and, and talking over the coffee, and somebody says, how do you feel? And they tell them the truth. And they open the zipper and let them see what's inside for a little while. And um, and then over a period of time, for whatever reason, if we keep doing this, we don't drink and we don't drink and we don't drink. And and if you if you don't drink and you don't die, you get to be an old timer. <laughs> and uh, I am I am a man who has finally found the thing. Chuck C used to talk about it. I have found the thing that I was looking for in the bottle. I have finally found the thing I was looking for in the bottle. I have found, finally, a way to live comfortably and peacefully and joyously with me. A day at a time. Oh, and one other thing. I have come to believe that a power greater than myself can restore me to sanity. I don't think he's done it yet, but I think he can. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.